Americans are generally said to love the values of Adam Smith, the open competition. We love, you might say, the ideas of openness, decentralization, competition. That's Adam Smith. These are the ideas associated with the American economy, and, and even more deeply, the American Revolution, the First Amendment. The strange thing, and these are the internet values, the strange thing, however, is when you look carefully at the history of the American industries of information, they have much less to do with any of this, and rather with a specific history of individualized information empires. That is to say, American history of communications and information is much less a story of Adam Smith and much more a story of Joseph Schumpeter. <laughs> this man, looking kind of serious, <laughs> Joseph Schumpeter believed two things that were particularly important. Things that when you that when they, they, when they enter your head, they sort of stick there forever. The first idea he had was the idea that all economic growth, all of this increase in GDP that politicians and industry spend so much time on, is only innovation. That is, there's no difference between economic growth and innovation. That they are exactly the same thing. Every time you see more money being made, more goods being produced, it's because of some improvement in how it's being done. The second thing he believed was that capitalism had nothing to do with price competition. Nothing to do with this three or four people trying to sell the good for the lowest price. This was, he said, a mythology. Capitalism instead was survival of the fittest, was the story of life and death, of competition not in the market but for the market, of one company after another eating or destroying the company in front of it. In other words, it's the story of power as opposed to competition. And when he predicted that a truly capitalist market would resemble a succession of monopolistic empires, <clears throat> each upending the next. And that was the true nature of capitalism, a story of life and death, struggle to be on top, with great similarity to the natural cycles of, of evolution. So what we see in American history of information industries, I didn't talk about other industries, but particularly in information, is one of market dominating market monopolies and oligopolies interspersed with periods of competition. This diagram is a little confusing, but let me give you, as opposed to a story of competition, what the, the main actors in American information history are. AT&T, monopoly that lasts 70 years, 1914 till 1984. In other words, a plurality of, of the time of the American Republic. Companies like Paramount, which built the Hollywood cartel, created a system for, for distributing movies based explicitly on Henry Ford's theory of building automobiles with vertical integration of every single component of filmmaking, modeled to some extent, which still survives. NBC, which centralized the once vibrant open radio networks into a single chain network. <coughs> IBM, which controlled the computer industries for decades. Companies like Microsoft, <laughs> slightly older logo, <laughs> early version of Windows, which still controls operating systems. And our contemporary friends, Google, like Google, like Facebook, and the rest of the internet monopolists. So the premise is, I'm going to suggest that we can learn something about today's internet monopolists and how to build an information empire from the history of information empires. Question is, where do these things come from, if they've been so important in American history? 
Where exactly do they come from? Where, you know, we're just used to it, sort of a fact of our landscape. We just take it for granted that there's Google, there's Microsoft, there's in our current landscape, and that 50 years ago there was NBC, AT&T, and so forth. Where do these things actually come from? Well, the truth is they come from what were once open and vibrant industries, open industries that get closed by a number of factors. And when you look at it carefully, oh, let me give you four examples. So the telephone markets, before AT&T's takeover, In, the, in this period between 1894 and 1914, approximately, there were not hundreds or not dozens, but thousands, thousands of independent companies that were offering telephone service in the United States. There was a time where it was not unusual for any person your age to say, well, you know, I'm going to start a telephone company. It sounds ridiculous at this stage. I, I presume no one here thinks, oh, you know, I'm going to go start a mobile company. It's just not. The barriers to entry have, have become uh, too great for that to happen. But there was a time it was normal for someone to string wires between houses, create their own telephone network. A thousand competitors. Eventually swallowed by AT&T. There was a time when film, uh, sometimes we think YouTube has, was, uh, is the era, our current era is the era of, of decentralized filmmaking. There was an era where film was an extremely open, competitive industry. There were 4,229 4, films reviewed in 1994. That's something like 11 films made per day. Now, these weren't you know, Lord of the Rings or something. When you watch the films, a lot of them are like people running around, chasing each other with, hitting each other with bats and stuff like that. I mean, they're not high-tech special effects films, but there was thousands of films being made at one point in American history per year. And what's interesting is the ideological expanse of the films, or the ideological diversity of the films made in these eras. There were anarchist films, there were white supremacist films, there were uh, uh, socialist films, fascist films. Every kind of film, essentially, was being made. It was not unusual for unions to make films, firms to make films. Film was anyone's game at one point in the 1910s. It seems very hard to imagine now. It's a, it's, you can imagine actually making YouTube videos, but it's hard to imagine film being an open industry in the same way. There's a bit. Uh, there's independent film and so on and documentaries. We're more open than, in, than, say, in the 1950s. And eventually that, uh, through a long converted his convoluted history, which uh, is described in, in the book, the era of hundreds or thousands of producers became an effectively or ultimately dominated by a cartel um, of, ver of, of people who delivered, and we'll see what they delivered uh, in a minute, but of, of filmmakers. Interestingly, almost all of them came from the Lower East Side. <laughs> almost to a, to a man. These fellows were all Jewish immigrants from the Lower East Side who, um, through a long process, eventually established an industry, mostly in violation of the patent laws. Which is another long, long story. Um, and eventually fled to California, started their industry in Hollywood, and created these, uh, these four companies. There's a couple more. I just put those four up. Radio is another similar story. Radio had its own open era, sort of decentralized, internet boom-like era. Uh, this is a 1922 book that claims at one point in New York City, there were so many radio stations it was impossible to listen, to list them all. And I've looked at the old books of radio station guides, and there's hundreds and hundreds of radio hundreds and hundreds of radio stations, many more radio stations than today. One of the main reasons was that you didn't actually need anything but the most basic license. Everyone could run a radio station, you had to buy the equipment, set things up. Very similar to setting up a web page. Now, eventually there was interference problems and so forth, but there's a quote from this era where they said, any boy can have a radio station if he really wants to. 
So something is amateurs, local church groups, radio clubs, motorcycle shops, all of them could have radio stations. That eventually, <coughs> over time, came under the dominion of one or two companies who offered something different and better, or at least more appealing to the Americans, the <coughs> National Broadcasting Corporation. And again, the history detailed in the book. Now, when you look carefully at, at each of these periods of history, when you look carefully at all of the once formerly open industries that became dominated by one or another major player, it turns out there's four ingredients, four tools that are used or are involved in the creation of a market dominating oligopoly. The first is typically in the life cycle of these industries. The open industries have an appeal to people because they are new, they're open, they have great promise. But, and you may think of your own internet experience, there's a tendency for them to be inconsistent, be problems like the equivalence of spam, unreliability, poor quality, there's a general confusion and fragmentation. And so, in a very profound way, it is us who builds monopolies by a demand for higher quality, a demand for less chaos, a demand for convenience. You can see in the film industry, this was this is the catering. This is, this is built on, on the example of things like this. Anyway, the point of this, uh, this demonstration, <laughs> the point of this demonstration is to show that what all of these companies that, that grew to dominate fragmented industries offered was a, something that wasn't possible to football before. That is, they used economies of scale or, or other things I'll talk about in a minute to put together something that to cater to the demand for convenience or quality. <laughs> That exists among <laughs> consumers. Um, when AT&T came to power, this is an old AT&T ad, its logo was right here. One policy, one system, universal service. So they said, these thousands of telephone companies are crazy. Competition, AT&T said over and over again, is bad for the country. Competition is wasteful, it's chaotic, it just creates problems. We are offering one policy, one system, universal service. The country needs one thing and one thing alone. It needs AT&T. We will serve the nation. We will provide excellent and reliable phone service. And we'll have a monopoly for 70 years. And this appeal was strong. This appeal was uh, was convincing not only to, to Americans but to the government, which said, "Yes, let's have AT and T run things." So it is this this interest in a single thing, and you can imagine your own life. I don't want to take this too far, but how? Actually, I'll get to this when we talk about other things. So they appeal to that. The other thing they relied on, and this is something you'll know if you've studied any basic economics, is they relied on the idea the economic principle that certain goods become more valuable the more people use them. So this is the AT&T network. It's obvious that a phone network with everyone on it is more valuable, is more valuable than one with just 50 people on it. In the same way Facebook, we'll talk about this later, why do you use Facebook? Well, because that's where everybody is. There are certain types of products, and information products tend to be among them, 
where the good, again, becomes more powerful the more people use it, and that tends to lead to a single market power. So all of the companies that have been successful in this area have relied on this network effect. And the final and sort of most obvious thing is simply economics of scale. And in many ways, the radio and television networks were the most pop, were the most obvious example of this. Imagine back again what I described, where you had hundreds or thousands of radio stations or TV stations. Each of them making content for their audience can rely only on the advertising revenues available from whatever their audience is, let's say 2,000 people. The birth of NBC and CBS was the birth of a network that could rely on reaching millions of people, tens of millions of people, eventually almost 100 million people in a single broadcast, rely on the advertising revenue that comes from the scale of reaching the entire nation at once through the most powerful, one of the most powerful information strategies in the whole history of humankind, prime time. <laughs> the idea of an entire nation sitting down for a few hours certain times of the week to, to watch the same things created an enormous financial base to produce higher quality programming that was not available to scattered, fragmented firms. And the final thing that we can't neglect <laughs> is an incredible will in the leaders of these companies to own an empire, to be in charge. Joseph Schumpeter, in a 1911 book, said there are certain, he's talking about men, and in this book there are always men. Oh. <laughs> in the uh, 2000s that may change. There are certain people almost littered throughout society who are unusual creatures, who aren't like normal people. Their motivation are not the ordinary motivations of human beings who are interested in money or luxury or, or a comfortable life. These are men who are motivated by the dream and will to found a private kingdom, the will to conquer, the impulse to fight, to prove oneself superior to others. This is what they work for. They don't care about money. They don't care about anything else. Otherwise, it would be different. And these are the people, he said, who build monopolies, who are the great entrepreneurs. Great in the sense of also terrific. <coughs> Terror-inducing. And it's these kind of men who you see behind every single information empire in American history. Here's Theodore Vail. The president of AT&T who built the monopoly, what his biographer said about him. He, had, he always had a taste for conquest. He could do nothing in a small way. And this is a quote from Thomas Edison, Mr. Vale is a big man. <laughs> <laughs> this is David Sarnoff who, who founded and, and built NBC, who was quoted as a genius in the art of industrial combat. Man who claimed himself, claimed that he was a prophet prophet of the information age, who foresaw radio, foresaw television, foresaw the VCR, cell phone. A man who actually fabricated his own documents to prove that he invented or foresaw technologies like the radio, the VCR, and the television. So he could prove that he had been like a Chinese emperor of rewriting history, that he had been there all along knowing what was going to happen. David Sarnoff. And finally, you have more <laughs> clear examples, the most clear examples of will to power in German radio in the 1930s, which I haven't talked about too much. But the, the, the Germans, the Nazis understood this very explicitly, that what is it different about the information industries than orange juice or rubber boots or something? It is the power over people's minds that you are getting power over. That is why you see a special character a special kind of character who gets involved in these kind of industries. You're not just selling something that cleans or whitens people's teeth. You're selling something that will inform 
what they view as the good in life, what they aspire to, what kind of narratives are their narratives, who they look up to. Selling information, being the head of an information empire, is a rare opportunity to be in the business of peddling mind, control over people's minds. And it's always attracted a certain type of figure. This is the model, and this shows the link of industrial structure. This is the model of Joseph Goebbels when he took over the German radio. And as he said, radio or any kind of broadcast technologies is a spiritual weapon, ultimately, of the totalitarian state. So I bring this all up to say that when we're talking about control of the information that companies, we're ta the stakes are different. It's not Alcoa steel or aluminum. <laughs> so let's see how these ideas apply to some of the empire empires in our time. It may all seem sort of like an ancient history, artifacts of a different era. But we are, in many ways, in the same situation that we are in with all the rest of these in the 1940s and 30s. We have, in our time, an open internet, an open network, a new invention, bold, idealistic, one that many people believe or hope will change the world, make it different. There's always a sense for these new technologies. Something I talk about in our book, many religious movements believe that the source of human suffering or problems is our, our failures of communication. I, or not only in religion, but also in, in many things. That people, for some ways, uh, don't understand each other, and this is why they fight. The true goal of Esperanto, the language, the universal language, was to break down the boundaries of nationalism. And the founder of Esperanto, said that once everyone can understand each other, read each other's literature, the walls between civilizations will fall down, the idea of war will seem an absurdity, we will all become like one family. And that always influences these new technologies, and it's very true with the internet. The idea is everyone has a web page, everyone can communicate with everyone all over the world, we shall again all be as one family. We shall eliminate the artificial distinctions between humans that create the suffering, or create misunderstandings, create conflict. Well, let's see what, what um, types of factors are going on in our, in, our, in our current affairs. Well, what I'm going to suggest is many of the same ingredients, the four ingredients, are yet again being relied upon in an effort to build what would effectively be the master switch in the internet age. Companies such as Apple, Google, Facebook, I don't know it, and it's not an accusation, it's natural, are in some ways following very carefully on everything that happened before. So let's, let's start with this quality element. This is a familiar figure. What have we learned in the last four years? What have we learned from our users? Well, we've learned a lot. The first thing is, the number one, two, and three thing they want is they want Hollywood movies and TV shows whenever they want them. It's that simple. It's not really complicated. They want Hollywood movies and TV shows. They don't want amateur hour. They want professional content. There's our friend Steve Jobs. This is... Steve Jobs and Apple are particularly interesting because they borrow very explicitly from the playbook or the strategies of the Hollywood studios in the 1920s, 1930s. As I said, in that time, film was scattered, amateur hour. And they said, what people want are products that work better, where everything is integrated, perfectly designed, and the consumer doesn't have to worry about anything, and they get access to the best stuff. So Apple's strategy right now is to unify Hollywood content with its devices over the wires, mostly of AT&T and maybe Verizon, to deliver what you could describe as the best of everything, a full vertical integration at all levels. 
Let's see what else we have. Well, network effects. Remember I said that these are incredibly important in building monopolies. The idea that if one person, one thing becomes popular. Well, the most obvious example of this in our age is right here. I don't know if you can see this graph. There are the fates of MySpace and, and Facebook. I don't think there's a clearer illustration of this factor. Maybe some of you were MySpace users five years ago. Who here is now a, a MySpace user? All right. <laughs> Who here is a MySpace or, or Friendster? Five years ago, or when you first started, who here has been, was a user of either Friendster, MySpace, or one of those other ones? Not that many. How many people are Facebook users now? So that is the power of network effects. The good has become powerful because everyone is using it. And once there, it becomes very hard to leave. You want to leave Facebook for some end competitor, let's say Google Buzz or something. You have to convince everyone to come with you. And I don't know how you do that. And so the same exact factor that brought the AT&T network to power is having a powerful effect in our, in our current time. And this is finally economies of scale. This is just the idea once you're big enough, you can spend more money on directed products. Well, this is one thing. There's a, a lot of these companies use this with One of the things that Google is able to do now, given its size and its revenue, and about $20 billion of cash, is it's able to concentrate its resources into building enormous banks of servers or, or, or linked computers, as this, this discussion talks about, so that it gets harder and harder and harder for any search engine to compete with it. The number of servers make Google react faster. The amount of computing power make its search results seem more logical. And it also gets something on the network effects. But we're talking here again, not a race between small players, but a race between entities that have enough resources to invest in this kind of power to deliver these kind of products. Who here uh, uses Google? Tell me we're not living in a monopoly age. Who here doesn't use Google ever? And finally, we have the same old idea that there are, again, men interested in controlling a private kingdom who are not, you know, are interested in providing a better product, but at some point, have as their aspiration this idea. Here's a clip. Uh, what people who you might respect have said about these kind of subjects, in particular, my 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 opinion, but it's not developed. Who said that where there is no conflict, there is no light. That's the point that I want to make today. What I've learned. Most people get stuck when they get into a working world. They sit around and things become common. They don't think they, they don't take things seriously enough. They don't recognize the changes part of the world. My experience, given that I have a research background, was that I expected that people would sit around and they would have uh, interesting discussions and they would all be very knowledgeable and they would agree. In fact, the most successful companies are one where there's enormous conflict. <laughs> we have an idea that we want to talk about. This is obvious stuff. It's going to be online in a second. This is going to be new. So should we send it to the person? Just a couple of people. The question is, where are they going to send it to? Send up 2,200 leads within two hours? Thousand. 22,000. They don't want you. They want your idea. We don't know what it can be. We don't know what it will be. We know that it's cool. It's soon here in federal court. You guys were the inventors of Facebook? Is there anything that you need to tell me? A billion dollars is cool. You know what's cool? A billion dollars. I can't wait to stand on your shoulder and watch you write us a check. Oh, there's a little power. So, 
Maybe I'll stop by, by saying what I think about all of this. I have a hard topic. I, I wrote about this book because I'm inherently, internally conflicted about everything in it. Like a lot of you, I probably like the idea of competition, open systems, Adam Smith. Like a lot of you, in my current life, I use Facebook, Amazon, Skype, Twitter, Apple, Google, and eBay. That spells fast age, by the way. <laughs> in other words, I enjoy the fruits of monopoly. I'm like everyone here. Who here does not? I mean, we all use those. We all use the monopoly firms, and we like them. Maybe some people avoid them in a certain kind of I hate Starbucks kind of kind of thing. But most, you know, I, I like these things, and I, I can't deny they they create great products. But I also, from studying the history, have a clear feel, feeling or sense that after a long time in power, you tend to see a certain degree of stagnation. And a monopolist, while well, it often goes through an early golden age, as it ages, beyond that, it tends to get abusive and stagnant. There's a great analogy, in fact, to political leaders. Many of the dictators or, or new congressmen come into power, a lot of ideas for reform, and indeed are often quite good for the first 10 years or so. And then they become interested much less in will to innovation and much more interested in will to power. In other words, they become interested in, in staying in power forever. And that tends to be the problem with information monopolists. So, what do I think we should do? Well, I have a couple ideas, and I'll, and I'll put them out there. One of them is the separation growth. As I've said, I think it's hard to stop monopoly power. To have the governments kind of preemptively destroy companies that are succeeding and pleasing the American people, it's difficult. It would mean right now breaking Facebook into five pieces or something, five companies. It would mean breaking Google away from Gmail and, and Google Maps and all of its other companies. To stop monopoly growth in these markets would take measures that most of us would find extremely difficult to stomach. <coughs> and would cost a lot of time and effort by the antitrust department or other measures. It would regard, require a certain level of government involvement that I don't think anyone in the United States is comfortable with. On the other hand, <coughs> And sometimes these companies are so powerful that they begin to implicate not just economics, higher prices, the kind of stuff you learn in the antitrust class, but they start to implicate separation of powers itself. They start to, to implicate the question of whether there is too much concentrated power. In too few hands, the, the original problem that prompted the American Revolution. And so one of the things I suggest is a kind of separation of powers theory for the information industries. So this is the constitutional theory for the information industries, not based on the real constitution, but on the idea that there's a value that transcends regulation. And that is this idea to keep content and transport separate. That is to say, to keep the companies that create information separate from the companies that carry it at some level. And the reason is that every history I've looked at, when I've read, gone through this in the book and through my research, the abuse and the problems and the, the censorship, uh, which I have discussed, are almost always linked to one company gaining control over both the means to move information and the information itself. There's an inherent conflict of interest. I'll bring up one example, although I, I didn't put in these slides. Western Union in the, in the 1870s, probably the, the worst example in history of, of abuse by an information monopolist, had complete control over the telegraph system, which was at the time the only way to move information instantly from one place to another. They had a very close partnership with the Associated Press, which was a monopoly on news. Uh, news wires, that is moving uh, instant information. 
So you had one source of instant information in, the, in the, this era, 1870s. And what do they do with it? Well, they used to try and throw elections. They chose candidates and used their joint monopoly over instant news to try and get some elected and stop others from getting elected. So this began, something that seems like an issue of, of monopoly and prices and antitrust becomes a political issue at some point. And that's why I'm suggesting that some line between content and transport is very important. We need to think of this as like church and state, news and editorial, investment and, and uh, investment advice and investment services. There are various lines that you keep in American society or any society that are designed to create inherent conflicts of interest. The other idea I have, maybe just a term limit. When you have a pow problem of power, one of the solutions is you say, OK, we have this problem of excessive power. We'll just put a limit on it by saying it ends at some point. So no matter how bad it is, eventually it ends. And I don't know the number. What do they say here? 30 years? Maybe 20 years, 10 years? Give Facebook its time. Give Google its time. If they get destroyed by competition, that's great. <laughs> but eventually, if it's just been too long, you just knock on the door and say it's over. All this must end. We didn't do that with AT&T, and they were in charge for 70 years. Didn't do that with NBC, CBS, CBS. They had, uh, they had their monopoly for about 50 years, their triopoly. Maybe eventually we just say, listen, it's, too, it's gone on too long. <coughs> anyway, those are the ideas in the book. Um, it's available, as I said, for sale. And, and this, is designed, this is actually designed as a book talk, but also the sales pitch. So it's a very handy Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'd love to take uh, questions from anyone. We've got about 15 minutes. Very, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting question. And I, when I say 30-year limit, 
how you end it is a, is a great is a sort of question I haven't fully answered. Um, one way, quite radical, but uh, reasonable in some ways, is you, in some ways you nationalize a thing, or in other words, it's not quite the right word, you, you make the essential protocols public, public domain protocols. So the Facebook code, essentially, the internal code becomes like Mozilla, some kind of public source code that anyone. So it, it, you somehow convert it to a public source, uh, unowned monopoly. That's one thing. So it's still a monopoly, but it doesn't, there's a, it's less owned, like the way Wikipedia is or Mozilla. Um, another thing you can do is to let it is at that point you can assume it's achieved a certain amount of vertical integration with other things. You can try and chop it down to just the core function that it performs and try and slice off those other functions. I don't know what those will be 10 years from now, but one of those things, so if you're dealing with Google, for example, and you think Google has too much power uh, 10 years from now, you chop off everything from the search engine. You say, you run a search engine, they don't do anything else. Okay, fine, here's the search engine. You do a great job with that. You are a search engine company. You're not also a blah, 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 blah. But no, it's not easy. It's hard because government again has to get involved, and there's always a problem that you discuss, which is a prolonging a monopoly when you're trying to stop it. Yeah. Isn't one of the keys here interoperability? And maybe this is what you what you mean by uh, mm -hmm. kind of transportation. Right. <clears throat> I think the example would be the old AT and T phone. Yeah. That is, you know, it's, it's works for 50 years. It's connected to the network. You have to get it from AT and T. Versus, say, the smartphones that now operate on uh, a variety—I mean, a variety of the four networks that we've got—that um, are replaced every two years, and pretty much anybody can enter the market because as soon as you have a smartphone, you can connect to everybody else who has a smartphone. Right. So, so isn't the key also to kind of have just standard protocols that allow anybody mm -hmm. to kind of benefit from the network effects? Yeah, that 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 is in some ways um, an ideal solution. Well, it depends on who you, you talk to. But yes, I, I think the underlying protocols or the interoperability is often extremely important in these information networks. And so for example, the reason there's not an internet monopoly per se, a monopoly over the internet, is because nobody un owns the underlying protocols of the internet. You know, you've never, there's no email monopoly. Email is actually more important than Google, probably. There's no email monopoly, why? because they're all open protocols. So one solution to this problem, uh, it's a little bit what I said in my answer here, is you demand that the most powerful protocols be open. Now, how do you do that? Sometimes you can hope it happens, like it did happen with email and so forth. Um, what happens if, a, if it's gone too far? Then you have a question of, can the government successfully come in, or some other entity successfully come in and try and force the opening or interoperability I've tried that. Let's tried this with Microsoft a little bit. But it's a tricky business. But I agree with you. That is part of the center of, of, of what you do about an information monopolist. Yeah? How do you define monopolist and when does you know, that 30 year period begin? So, like, is Twitter, Yelp, or Square, like, are they monopolists yet, or like, did they, you know, right. a little while ago? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, I've. I've there, I define the phrase monopoly or more like a 19th century person than a 21st century economist. Economists have defined the word monopoly to a very narrow uh, phrase, most which I think have lost the meaning, the original meaning or the older meaning, which is the firm with market power. And um, I, I, it, it's not an easy question, what is a firm with market power? Uh, you know, you can draw a line, you can say anyone who has, say, 50% of their market is a monopolist. Well, like, yeah. And then how does it right? And when does the clock start thinking? Clock starts thinking. Clock starts thinking. I mean, basically, you just, just you just have to decide. I mean, the day Twitter was born, it had 100% of the market. Yeah, that's it's, true. Like, <laughs> so. You just got to figure it out. So that's what law is always about, drawing lines. So some you just have to figure it out. You know, it's a hard thing to, to say. There should be a hard term limit. It, it's not, it, it's a, it's a, it is a tricky idea for exactly the kind of reasons you're talking about. Now let's say everyone likes Twitter and it kind of operates fine for 30 years. Why or why, why break it up then? It's always a presumption. It's always based on a presumption. It's like any line drawing. It's always based on a presumption that we're trying to avoid um, 
problems and make sacrifices good things in the process. So a lot of presidents at the end of eight years are still going pretty good. You think, well, let's have another four, maybe another eight. The so Ronald Reagan after a year probably could have gone for another four. Well, I don't know what his position was. <laughs> Bill Clinton was very popular when he left office. He was said his approval ratings were in the 60%. Probably would have been fine. I, I'm trying to think of other presidents in our lifetime who haven't ended their careers in straits. <laughs> <laughs> but often, you know, you run at the end of the year, that's why FDR stayed in power probably too. People said, keep it going, this is great. Your man's doing a great job. Um, you do lose any time you have some kind of fixed limit like this. You lose certain efficiencies. You lose problems. And you also have these problems we're talking about, trying to figure out when actually they were a market monopoly when they were. And the answer to those questions is they're answerable. They're just not easy to answer. You just you know, you see what kind of consensus you think is going. I think if companies knew they had a term limit on their monopolies, they might try and make the best of it. Or they might start looting the company right when it was over. I'm not sure what would happen. <laughs> this is the nature of an idea. Yeah. How can you separate, separate the transportation of the information and the culture? I mean, I see it in such an industry like the old industry or energy market, which you can separate the production of electricity and the network. But like on Google and Facebook, there is no content in transportation. I would suggest. Uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. What, what does that mean? Uh, I guess for now I, I would say with the creation of content, there's traditional creation of content. The domain of the copyright industry is the exercise of creative choice to create a product, that, expressive product that people consume. Neither of which face, which Google does not do. Google leads you to content and it isn't content. Right, maybe Maps is a close call. But generally Google is leading you to content and it isn't content. Generally, the phone companies are leading you to content. They aren't content. Right? So that, that, that's the thing. I'm not denying it can get tricky as to what exactly those things are. But there are, after a while, layers in the industry that you can see. And right now, I'm including, uh, yeah, you could also, yeah, it, it's a hard, it's a tricky question to say what exactly this link is. But I, again, suggest that, and maybe I can put it this way, that excessive vertical integration has been the source of evil in the information industry. Yeah. We, we can expect, uh, or would you expect one of these information monopolists to eventually win over the internet? It's a very interesting question. What would, you, what would the internet look like? Very interesting question. It is possible. It is possible to have two, or to have one. I mean, it is possible that all of the Google will get overextended. Let, let me tell a possible history. So it, it turns out people don't like search engine on their television, which is what Google TV is trying to do. It turns out that basically people like Apple products the best. Apple has partnerships with Verizon and AT&T, and they basically like Hollywood content the best. And eventually, what you need to understand is you have a birth of sort of the internet too, or some special internet which has most of the chosen content and chosen sites. And eventually, that just kind of becomes what everyone does. And in that case, I think you could definitely see a world where, for example, Apple took over, or Apple and Apple's allies, in some sense, ruled everything. I think it's very possible. And we sort of are, you know, you just didn't use search as often. Or maybe it becomes a, a, a secondary industry. I don't think one company will ever run everything internet. It just it seems implausible. But I think it is possible that one could sort of become the dominant company. Right now, there's a terrific contest between Google and Apple. Which in some ways is a contest for the for the future, I, and I advise you to pay attention. How often you end up sort of using Apple or using Google, and you will be watching future being made in front of your eyes. Because ideologically, these firms are very different in their approach. Apple is, uh, as I said before, basing its strategies <coughs> on most of the 20th century industrial empire strategies: Ford Motors. Um, Hollywood Studios, AT&T like strategies of integration that benefits Carnegie Steel. The greatness of integration is all what Apple's about. And Google is betting on 21st century ideas of openness, decentralization, innovation. You know, here comes everybody. Uh, Matt, and, and, and I'm not sure who's going to win this battle, or if there is going to be one winner. Oh, yes, question. 
um, you coin net neutrality. It's been a very successful idea, you know. Um, and uh, the logical conclusion would seem to be the separation principle. Now, we've seen, say, the FCC adopt net neutrality as a, as a thing going forward. We've seen them throw out the, the Berkeley report, you know, right. um, the Berkman reports. And right. so do you think they'll come around, or do you think maybe the FTC will adopt the separation principle and impose it on the FCC? I hope that the FCC, I mean, net neutrality, let me talk about the relationship net. Net neutrality is sort of a prototype of a greater separation principle. Net neutrality says that the carriers of information should treat all content providers equally. Right? In the same way AT&T was, was a common carrier, it's very related to common carriage. It is, as I said, a small prototype for a, for a broader principle in general that is opposed to excessive integration in the information industries. So how exactly you do it is a, is a longer discussion, how, what, how the FCC, but mostly in my mind has to do with, with oversight and with discouragement of excessive integration. Um, with the transport and content question, it seems like there's two things going on, like what you were just talking about, net neutrality, and then things like where, you know, there was a talk last week about news aggregation sites where, you know, right. like the Times is making the content and Google is carrying it. So are you talking about that kind of separation to eliminate the Google News or those kinds of aggregators? I, I'm not talking about eliminating aggregators, because I think that is, the, that is exactly what the line is, right? The Google Providing you, they're not actually. The Google starts to buy newspapers, which they have talked about. That I think is going to the line. Okay. Now, what's interesting about these questions is they're not. There are hard questions. It's a little bit like church and state. You have a principle of church and state, and then you have a question of well, what happens when you have a you know a Jesus club or something. So there's always going to be hard questions. But the important thing is the underlying principle is that you're sensitive to the idea that there's a danger of church state. And, and you have some clear ideas of what the problem. So in that specific case, I don't think it's a problem for Google to gather news, but I do think it's a problem for Google to own the news, own, own the newspapers. So then it starts becoming, and I hope everyone can see from that why then it has an inherent conflict of interest. If you're the one who supposedly offers a search service that, that's fair and neutral, but then you also own some of the news, it may not happen right away, but there is this inherent conflict of interest problem. Yes. Google Books, at least in theory, again, is also a separation of transportation and content. Because they're not a publisher, they are a way to find books. But then, then we only find the books that they put out. In theory, you are finding the books that you want to find. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? No, it's important. I mean, Google is an important switch. And so that's why it's actually extremely important that Google stay out of content. The, the, the moment Google really goes into content, that mean, I mean, it has a stake. Google doesn't care what book succeeds. You see that? Google does not care on Google Books that one book is popular or isn't popular. They just want, at least now, to provide some way to find the stuff. It's the same thing with web pages. They don't care what web page is number one, at least in theory. They just care that you can get to that web page. The moment that starts to change, the moment the system gets corrupted and the dangers arise. But they are starting to care, right, about what web page comes up and If they do, it's the moment that happens, the moment that happens is the moment Google undercomes intense federal scrutiny. The moment it starts modifying its search results, so that, for example, you search for the Republican Party and you don't you get disparaging results, the moment they start monkeying with their search results is the moment they get into trouble. It's actually the exact moment that happens when the antitrust investigation will be launched. I can promise you that. And I think Google knows that too, which is why they're not doing it. One reason why they're not doing it. I think they also believe it's wrong. Uh, so you already had a question. Anyone else? Yeah. The master switch. The master switch. The, uh, the title comes from something that Fred Friendly said. Fred Friendly used to be here at Columbia, who's the president of CBS News in the 50s. And he said once, um, he said, you know, what we're talking about, he's talking about broadcast networks and their power. And he's saying, the importance here is not so much the First Amendment or not even censorship, but exclusive custody of the master switch. Which is to say that this idea that more important and any of these sort of loose legal concepts are the idea of who actually 
has the power to control what information reaches people. But that is, the power, that is where the real power comes from in our society. Hence the title of the master switch. So a lot of what it's a metaphor, there's no actual master switch out there. <laughs> but I think you know, maybe Google search engine comes pretty close, to be honest, in, in our career. But it's tr the companies who are struggling, who are aspiring to power, every one of them wants to go grab a hold of that master switch at some level. OK, I think it's all our time. Thank you very much for coming. And, uh, I should say the book is available at, at, at the University <laughs> Bookstore and also on Amazon.